Kirk Curb Street, ESPN College Football Analyst. Herbie, how is your day? I'm good, man. How you doing? Well, I've had better days. Uh, had a bad day yesterday, and it's continued today. We've lost the key to Carson Palmer's Heisman. Uh, you know, the container. We sent the box back to him. He loaned us his Heisman for about a year. Oh. And then we sent oh. it back. And he wanted it for the College Football Hall of Fame induction. And he has the case. He doesn't have the key to open it up. Oh, my gosh. I know. What are you going to do? You well, can't. You can't uh, is it too late to well, get it to him? Do you know, because you guys do the, the uh, Heisman show, and do you know if there is one key that fits all Heisman suitcases? Well, you know there's only one person that you can ask that to, and that's the commissioner of college athletics. That's Chris Fowler. I, he, I have no idea at mm. all uh, how that works. Chris is intimately involved in the Heisman. Paulie, I'm, I'm just merely a pawn. Paulie, can you check with Fowler or Fritzy and just see, is, yeah. is there a key that will open that up so I can get this to cars? I don't want him to break open that suitcase with the Heisman there, but that's <laughs> that. That's my problem. You're working the Heisman show, aren't you? No, oh. no. It, the last year, it's... it's um, it's a honestly a blessing because we do army Navy um, that same day. And all these years we would do army Navy with college game day, whether we're in Baltimore, Philly, or in this case in, uh, in New Jersey at MetLife. And then we would leave, we go back and, you know, you love to do the Heisman, but Lee and I, you know, we're in the back of the room, ask a couple questions and it's really Fowler and, and the four or five finalists. It's really their show. Well, we, uh, last year, got off of it and we got to stay or two years ago, we got to stay for army Navy and um, first time all these years of doing game day in the morning, never got to stay. And it's such a cool scene. And um, so no, this year I'll be, I'll be there again, watching uh, army and Navy fired up the uh, home Depot show uh, college game day. Army Navy will be at MetLife stadium. Uh, They'll be there this Saturday, 9 a.m until noon Eastern. I tell people, if you get any opportunity to go to an Army game, I haven't, I haven't been to a Navy game at Navy, but I've been to West Point quite a few times. And uh, I've been to the Army-Navy game as well. There's just something magical about it. Um, you know, when, it when, whenever you start to feel bad about who we are or what's going on in our country, yeah. just, just go and you see, you know, there's so many we positive things. <laughs> We still got a shot here when you go to an Army Navy game. <laughs> that's, 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 that's true. You're, you're, you're reminded of like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. You know, to see these guys and girls, what they're doing, it's it's impressive. I brought this up earlier in the show, and I don't know if it happens anytime soon, but I I wonder with name, image, and likeness, like Kenny Pickett at Pitt, what if he said to the Peach Bowl, "Hey, I don't." You know, you pay me $50,000, I'll play in the game. If not, I'm going to get ready for the draft. That it's it's not a meaningful game, and maybe the fact that we're going to expand the playoffs here soon. But, you know, Christian McCaffrey did it, what, six years ago. Leonard Fournette, people freaked out. You know, Kayvon Thibodeau is going to sit out, and nobody's going to care about that. I just wonder if, does it benefit Kenny Pickett to play in this Peach Bowl game? Um, it just depends on how you're wired. I, I, am not going to try to say these guys should or should not play. I I'm from a different generation, you know, like you, um, I, I try to do the best I can. You know, I have four boys that are all 21 and, and younger. I mean, I, I get the, this generation. It's not like I have my head in the sand, but I don't have to agree with it. Um, Kenny Pickett and Pitt are in uncharted waters. I mean, you, you say the peach bowl, like we're saying the blue bonnet bowl, uh, that's a huge game for that school and for Kenny Pickett, who is the leader of that team. I haven't heard him speak. I have no idea what his intentions are, but to me, there's something about putting on a uniform one last time with your boys and going out and competing that outweighs, this is just me, um, what, that would outweigh, you just played 12 games, some, some cases, 13 games. Um, and now you're going to say, I'm not going to play in this last game to get ready for the draft. If that's how you feel, then, then more power to you. But um, I, I think you have to look at it at, a, at kind of a case-by-case basis. The fact that Mario Cristobal left Oregon, he's the head coach of Miami, 
uh, Thibodeau decides that he's going to forego. It's not really a shocker there. Yeah. Um, but I, I would be really surprised if Kenny Pickett doesn't play in that bowl game for Pitt with the year that they've had. What did you make of his fake slide? Um, I, I, if, if I'm a defensive coach, I, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to start laying quarterbacks out and deal with the consequences because he, he clearly started to go into slide mode, give him credit for his instincts. You know, he's not really known for his feet and his athletic ability out in the open field. He's, he's, he's known for what he can do in the pocket, throwing the ball around, but he got out there and he started out, as you know, he started to go down and the safeties pulled up. And then he, he recognized that it was almost like you were in practice, you know, and the whistle blew and, and it was the end of a period. Uh, but the defender, I, if, I, if I'm a coach and I see that film, even if it wasn't my team, I'm going to use that as a copy to show, like, until he's down, you, you lay him out. Mm-hmm. I mean, people, you know how it is when a quarterback's in the open field. It's like, it's like every, a bunch of great white sharks trying to go get some chum. I mean, they're, they're trying to not just bring him down. They want to they wanna end his day. And so, you know, I, I think after seeing that, the reaction I've heard from a lot of guys that play defense is, you know, the whole reason they got us pulling up is so these guys are going to go down. And now he pulls that, uh-uh, no more. You know, that, that kind of attitude. Why did so many people doubt Nick Saban this past weekend? <laughs> well, because we've watched them play all year and they haven't lived up to their, <clears throat> their own standards. You know, and so I think a lot of us thought, something's not quite right. Yeah, Bryce Young's a phenom. Jameson Williams a phenom. The offensive line has some major issues, not one week or two weeks, but all year they, they've had some concerns. And Bryce Young's athletic ability has kind of pulled him out where he's had to scramble to throw. And now they're playing Georgia, the one team that's been consistent all year defensively. Um, I think a lot of people just knew that Nick Saban's team, they never show up to a stadium as an underdog. You knew they'd have a chip on their shoulder. But was it going to be enough to beat that Georgia team that we've watched only team all year that's been consistent? You know, sometimes you let up and you survive a game. Georgia didn't have that. They they were consistent all year long. So it was really more of not doubting Nick Saban, but the respect you have for Georgia. And then we were reminded pretty quickly that still Nick Saban in his prime standing on that sidelines still knows how to get his team ready to play in these big games. So um, we were all, we, I think we apologized on Sunday uh, for doubting him. <laughs> Cincinnati. <laughs> I, I think we, you can count on, you can count on one hand how many times we've doubted him since 2008. Well, you were part of the rat poison. I was. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm usually part of the rat poison, giving him too much, uh, you know, respect and too many, too many compliments. Isn't that amazing, though, Herbie, that Saban (laughs) rails on us if we say nice things about his team, and then he rails (laughs) on you when you don't say. So he's just using the media. Oh, for sure. Did did a great job. He did. He knows, and I knew knew he was going to use that. And I knew, think about that Alabama roster. Every game they play, coach is guarding against complacency. Literally every game they play. You know, he, the outside noise is Alabama's going to win. They're going to win. They're going to win. And finally, you, you saw them in the Iron Bowl. I mean, they they very easily and should have lost that game to Auburn, who's not having a great year. It was a rivalry game. They're down ten nothing, like eight minutes to go. If Tank Bigsby gets a first down, the game's over and they lose in, in the final minute of game. But he comes up a yard short, so Auburn has to punt. And Bryce Young in, ends up leading him on a on a long, you know, ninety whatever it was, five yard touchdown drive in a really a Heisman moment for him. But that's how they looked the week before, almost stumbling around. And so it, w- it wasn't that far-fetched, but you just knew he would have the, nobody believes, nobody believes you can play with this Georgia team. And they showed up. They have not looked like that all year. And, of course, they save it for the biggest stage of the year. Talking to Kirk Herb Street, College Game Day will be at Army-Nami MetLife Stadium this Saturday, 9 a.m. until noon. And uh, Herbie also part of the uh, college football playoff semis in the national title game, January 11th. Um, Cincinnati's chances, better chance against Alabama or Georgia? Um, 
I think Cincinnati has a chance in this game because of the way they play defense. And I think if they play Georgia, they would probably have a little bit of a better chance just because of the, how explosive Bryce Young and Jameson Williams can be in the passing game. John Mitchie, you probably, as you know, that number eight, he's out. You know, he's torn his ACL. and He was such a, a great compliment to the vertical stretch of, of what Williams could do downfield. He was always underneath on, on slants and little outside routes and just finding space. So you had to be worried about, about both of them because he was more yards after the catch. You take that away, Luke Fickle is a defensive-oriented, minded coach. He's got a veteran defense that went toe-to-toe with Georgia one year ago in, in their bowl game, and, and I think it gave him a lot of confidence coming into this year. Um, I, I think people that are, could name two players on the Cincinnati roster and probably think Cincinnati's going to get killed I, I would be careful there. I don't. I don't. I just don't see that. I think Cincinnati. You know, Desmond Ritter, the quarterback, has been around, played in a lot of big games. Um, they've got a running back in Jerome Ford, who, who actually was, you know, played big time football at Alabama before he transferred over. They, they, and they're going to show up. It's going to be the shoes on the other foot. Going back to Alabama, always being complimented. Oh, you're going to win by 20, no problem. And Cincinnati is going to show up with an attitude. Cincinnati's going to show up feeling disrespected. And uh, will it, again, be enough? We'll have to see. But I see that game being competitive um, more so than, than getting ugly. Is there a tactful way for these coaches to leave for one another job? Like, could Brian Kelly have done it differently that would have appeased more people? Yeah, I, I, I think um, the challenge I think people – don't understand is the the recruiting aspect of it and the timing of the recruiting the early signing period is is a week from tomorrow these athletic directors you know they're they're running a quote-unquote tempo offense to try to make a good hire to get a guy to a podium win the press conference and then literally walk out of that press conference and into a into a high school and start recruiting and so there there is urgency on on excuse me the USC side or, you know, the Notre Dame side or the LSU side, there's urgency to try to make a hire because you want to get the right guy and, and, and try to salvage a recruiting class. What, what we always focus on is how does Brian Kelly leave his team like that? How does Lincoln Riley leave his team like that? So for me, because I talk with a lot of these athletic directors and coaches kind of behind the scenes, um, you know, these, in the month, late latter part of November and in December, it's a little bit of a game because they want to be respectful of a coach trying to finish his season. And, and, you know, in Luke Fickle's case, he was so locked in on what his team was trying to do. I think ultimately he, he could have had his choices of USC, uh, of LSU, of Notre Dame, and potentially of Oklahoma. And he was so focused on what his team was doing. He was letting Jimmy Sexton know, listen, man, I, I, I don't want to go there. I don't, I don't, well, you're going to miss out on this job. I, okay. I'm, I'm, and I really, in today's day and age, you got to really respect. He wasn't just a candidate. I mean, he was the front runner for every one of those jobs and he, and he just wanted to finish the race. So it cost him all these jobs because of the timing. Um, and, and how do you do it tactfully? I think you, you finish your regular season. If you go to a conference championship, you know, you have your agent or whoever talking to the AD, say how he's coming, let him get to the finish line. You get to the finish line. If you qualify for a, 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 a you know, the, the playoff, you go do your press conference at your new school. You start to put the staff together behind the scenes, and then you go back and, and try to finish the playoff. Like that, that's what ideally I would love to see. You imagine if Notre Dame, if there were some upsets in front of them and somehow, some way, Notre Dame made the playoff. Um, Marcus Freeman's first game as a head coach would have been in a playoff yeah, because of what happened. So it's weird. I, I don't know if there's a, the, the perfect way to do it, um, but, but I think the recruiting aspect of it and trying to, like in Oklahoma's case, quit the – they were hemorrhaging, you know, losing recruits. Their brand was just getting, getting lapped by the day. They, they had to make a hire and, and do it quickly. And, you know, they eventually got their guy. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's very messy. Uh, because, and I think because of the timing more than anything. 
Yeah, I wondered if Oklahoma was going to match. From what I was told, that Lincoln Riley wasn't going to go to LSU. LSU thought they had him. He went back to Oklahoma and said, hey, you want to match this? And they said no. And then somebody caught wind of it with USC. They swoop in, and then all of a sudden they hire Lincoln Riley. Oklahoma going to regret not matching that LSU offer? Well, I, and I don't know if there's 100% truth to that. I, I, mean, I I'm really heavily involved with a lot of these guys and and the and the agents and ad's and i i you know mike bond had the most time of it mike bone had the most time of anybody the the ad at usc and i think he had kind of his a list of five or six guys from from work go which was i can't remember when clay helton got let go i mean it was way 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 back yeah. and he was he was swinging for the fences from the beginning behind behind closed doors and I know that, that uh, Lincoln was a name that, that he was kind of on his dream list of, of guys like Dabo and like huge names. And I think, you know, when exactly Lincoln found out is debatable and all that, and I'm not going to speculate, but I, I think Oklahoma felt they did match. They, they were the Sunday after the bedlam, they were doing everything they could with Joe uh, Castiglione and their president trying to say, hey, listen, listen, let us, let us try to do this. We'll get you this. We'll get you that. And from what I understand, it was more, it, nothing against Oklahoma and nothing against what they weren't doing and nothing against going eventually to the SEC. I think it was just a change. I think it was a new challenge going to LA and, and coaching at USC. I think it was just, it was more about what that had to offer than it was what's lacking at Oklahoma. So, uh, and then, you know, they went out and found a a former assistant and coordinator at Brent Venables. And, you know, I think both sides end up in a good spot, but uh, of course we won't really know until we're three or four years down the road from now, but not all, not all all of them always work out. That's for sure. Herbie, great to talk to you. My best to the guys and uh, have fun this weekend with army and Navy. I thought of you when the flyers had that big win and anytime UD wins a big game, I think of you with, with hoops because I go back as a kid to Rosie Chapman and, and some of those teams that they had, you know, I was like in middle school and those, those UD teams. And I just fell in love at a young age, Don Donaher and then Miguel Knight and that group. I mean, yeah. UD's always been, always been a fun brand to watch and an easy team to pull for. So uh, that was a great win. Hopefully they have a, a, a big, a big year this year. Thank you, Herbie. Good to talk to you. Safe travels. Okay. You guys have a holiday. Take care, fellas. Kirk Kerbstreet.